It's a great pleasure for me to be here. And of course, I thank the organizers for having invited me to say something about the history of general relativity. This morning, Paul Scheller already emphasized that much of what is discussed here in one way or the other relies on general relativity. By the way, I was also very pleased that he emphasized the role of Lemaitre, which is among the uh, cosmology community widely underestimated. I mean, he, he was really the first who understood the cosmological impl implications of general relativ relativity. He applied it in 27 and used the Slipher data, not Hubble slate data, the Slipher data to deduce uh, the Hubble constant got a bit uh, somewhat larger values than Hubble two years later. Uh, he, he, of course, had the channel redshift formula we all love and, and know. And uh, for, for a, a, a small redshifts, he got the Hubble law and he got, he got the uh, Hubble constant in the same range as Hubble two years later. When the Hubble paper appeared in 29, Lemaitre had already given talks in, in Brussels to the general public on the expanding universe using the balloon model. Of course, his talks are written up in French, but uh, I mean, this is a fact, and uh, I could say more about that, but let me start with my topic. <clears throat> now, Einstein's path to general relativity uh, meandered steeply, encountered confusing forks, and also included the big U-turn, as you will see. Einstein's own words to describe the ambivalent feeling, feelings of the searching mind are for unforgettable. I quote, <clears throat> In the light of knowledge attained, the happy achievement seems almost a matter of course, and any intelligent student can grasp it without too much trouble. But the years of anxious searching in the dark, with their intense longing, their alternation of confidence and exhaustion, and the final emergence into light, only those who have experienced it can understand it. This is, of course, not the place to give a complete <coughs> hist historical survey, which spans about eight years, started with special relativity, and uh, was then finally finished as, as I already indicate, after a big U-turn in November 1915. What I will do in this talk is to discuss in some detail Einstein's remarkable progress beginning August uh, 1912, shortly after he returned to Zurich, this time at the ETH, until about a half a year later, until spring 1913. Now, before I come to this, I should presumably indicate what he had already achieved before this period, but I will be very brief on that. <coughs> so I first discuss here Einstein's work before 1912 <coughs> on the next slide. Um, then I will talk about the starting point in August and some programmatic aspects, and then... <coughs> Uh, mainly concentrate on the search of the, uh, of the field equations. <clears throat> Depending on time, I will say a few other things. <clears throat> now, in 1907, while writing a review article on special relativity, Einstein added an important section on gravitation. Uh, th that says chapter 5 with the title, Principle of Relativity and Gravitation. This is, by the way, in Volume 2, Document 47, in the Collective Papers of Albert Einstein. <clears throat> Attempting to understand the empirical equality and in, of, inertia, of inertial and gravitational mass, Einstein speculated on the possibility of extending the principle of relativity to accelerated motion. <clears throat> with this basic idea, as he called it, which he referred to as the principle of equivalence, he went beyond the framework of special relativity clearly. Indeed, he did not seriously consider the possibility of a special relativistic theory of gravity until he was presented with such a theory by Gunnar Nordström. But I do not 
want to say anything about that part. <clears throat> His special formulation of the equivalence principle. He, he calls this the most fortunate thought of my life, became the guiding thread in his search of, for a relativistic theory of gravitation. Now, until 1911, Einstein worked apparently mainly on the quantum puzzles and did not publish anything about gravitation, <clears throat> but continued to think about the problem. Later, he wrote, between 1909 and 1912, while I had to teach theoretical physics at the Zurich and Prague universities, I pondered ceaselessly on the problem. When Einstein realized then in 1911 that gravitation, gravitational light deflection should be experimentally observable, he took the problem of the gravitation up again and began, as he said, I quote that there, to work like a horse in developing a coherent theory of the static gravitational fields. I mean, he started with the simple problem. <clears throat> Since he had found that the velocity of light depends on the gravitational potential, he concluded that the speed of light plays the role of the gravitational potential and proposed a nonlinear field equation in which the gravitational energy density itself acts as a source of the gravitational potential. Therefore, the field equation implies that the principle of equivalence is valid only for infinitesimally small space, uh, spatial regions, not as, not as, in, it's, uh, not as special as, it's not a, as, as special as he originally formulated it. In the second of his Prague papers on gravitostatics, he also showed how the equations of electrodynamics and thermodynamics are modified in the presence of a static gravitational field. By the way, in a definite way, these equations are still right. <clears throat> At this point, he began to investigate the dynamical gravitational field. <clears throat> now I come to a detailed discussion of Einstein's Zurich Notebook. It is really fascinating to study these research notes because one can see Einstein at work and theoretical physics at its best. Namely, a delicate interplay between physical reasoning based on an intuitive estimate of the most relevant empirical, empirical facts and equally important mathematical structural aspects and requirements. <clears throat> when Einstein arrived in Zurich in early August, he was convinced that the metric field of space-time generalizing the Minkowski metric to a pseudo-Riemannian dynamical metric was the right relativistic generalization of Newton's potential. <clears throat> the main question was to find the field equations for this field. <clears throat> but how to achieve this was in the dark, and he looked for mathematical help. Fortunately, Marcel Grossman, his old friend since his student time, was now also professor at ETH, and Einstein succeeded in gaining him as a collaborator in his search for the field equations. In the 1955 reminiscence, shortly before his death, Einstein wrote the following about the role of Grossman. Uh, that's all <coughs> I think I should read that. This is in honor of Grossman, and, uh, who will later not play such an important role. I was made aware of these works by Ricci and Levi Civita by my friend Grossman in Zurich when I put the problem to investigate generally covariant tensors who, whose components depend only on the derivatives of the coefficients of the quadratic fundamental invariant. He at once caught fire, also as a mathematician, he had a somewhat skeptical stance toward physics. That we all know also. <coughs> He went through the literature and soon discovered that the, the, the indicated, indicated mathematical problem had already been solved, in particular by Riemann, Ricci, and Levi Civita. This entire development was connected to the Gaussian, Gaussian theory of curved surfaces, in which for the first time systematic use was made of generalized coordinates. Louis Kolleros, another student friend of Einstein, who was also a mathematics professor at ETH during this time, remembered also in 1955. Einstein spoke to Grossman about his troubles and said one day, Grossman, you must help me, otherwise I'll go crazy. 
So that, after this introduction, I read part of it uh, from the manuscript because I wanted to cite Einstein. We go now, yeah, here is Grossman. There are not many pictures of Grossman, or photographs of Grossman. I come now to a detailed discussion. <clears throat> At the beginning of his uh, notes, Einstein sets up some requirements, uh, partly a bit later. And this is a mixture of mathematical and physical uh, parts. Very crucial for him, as you will see, was that the theory had to reduce to the Newtonian limit for weak fields and slowly moving matter. And you will see he ran into trouble uh, in, in connection with this. Then what is also very, very important in the, in the whole, uh, in the, in the whole uh, process are the conservation laws for energy on, on momentum for matter plus gravity. Then, of course, the equivalence principle must be embodied, and the theory respects the general principle of relativity to accelerating frames, taking into account that gravitation and inertia are described by one of the same dynamical field G mu nu. Einstein expressed this by the requirement of general covariance of the basic equations. This has had to become a much debated subject. Uh, I will uh, much later uh, make some remarks on that. Very early in his notebook, he discusses the coupling of gravity to matter, but here only in the first step, namely to dust. Uh, actually, he starts by generalizing his equations of motion he had in the Prague paper, uh, and this was formulated in terms of a variational principle for static fields to this uh, geodesic law we all know. And then writes the geodesic equation in this form. Now he makes a guess uh, and justifies that with on half a page, uh, how this should be translated to an energy, energy momentum conservation law for dust, given, given is an energy momentum tensor T alpha beta. Now, <clears throat> at this point, he's not at all experienced in the absolute calculus. This is, of course, uh, just the covariant divergence of T equal to zero. But he wants to check that this is a covariant equation. And so ask the question, given any symmetric tensor, and uh, if I then look at the left-hand side, is this a, again a tensor? And he makes a check by taking for T alpha beta the metric. Uh, and then, of course, he gets zero. That's just a metricity condition. And he's satisfied with that. In, in the paper with Grossman, of course, Grossman gives then a formal proof of, of his uh, guess. But uh, I, I, I wanted to say that, so that you see, I mean, he, has, he starts with meager knowledge of, of, of the calculus. <clears throat> Another thing, what, uh, from here to here, uh, there is no uh, straightforward de derivation. We would nowadays uh, justify this, this equation for us by by using kinetic theory and, 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 uh, use, and use the collisionless Boltzmann equation, and then you get that. Uh, but from there to the full description of dust, by giving also the, the, the standard expression for the, for the T alpha beta, namely rho times the velocity, the forward velocity times the forward velocity, that takes another assumption. In the kinetic theory, at, at the, the T alpha beta is the second moment, and uh, U is, of course, the first moment. So there is, there is some as assumption involved. But he guessed it, of course, correctly. <clears throat> and now he starts looking for a field equation. Uh, rather soon, but on the pages before 27, Again, he tries things which are very simplistic. Uh, for instance, uh, the most serious attempt is to, to set up this field equation. Actually, in unimodular coordinate. Uh, very often he uses the unimodular coordinates, not always, but. 
And then he substitutes this, this expression here on the left-hand side for TL uh, mu nu in the conservation law we just had, but then he produces third-order derivatives and this leads to nowhere. So now on page 27, he refers to Grossmann and writes down the fully covariant Riemann tensor. But he says not Riemann tensor, he says Grossmann and then writes down the, the, this, this tensor. He doesn't call it Riemann. I mean, that was the help of Grossmann. He gave him his, his tensor. And then he began to work on it and he immediately makes a contraction to the rigid tensor. And now he, he doesn't work with the gammas, with the Christopher simple symbols. Expresses everything in terms of the metric and its derivatives. Uh, then the first thing he knows, uh, notes the, is important. Besides this term, which looks like, like a d'Alembert, like a wave operator, there are three additional terms which have second the derivatives. And then on the knees of Sen, he writes, should vanish. I mean, the, the, the manuscript has very, very little text on this page. There is only this phrase, should vanish. Uh, and, and on the page before, too complicated. Uh, so, so uh, sollte verschwinden. The reason for that, he was looking for a, a field equation of this general form, gamma equal a coupling constant times t mu nu, and for gamma he made this ansatz, he, uh, something which in the linearized approximation would lead to a wave operator, plus terms which vanish in linear approximation. Now, something astonishing happens To get rid of these three terms which should vanish, he imposes harmonic coordinates. I mean, this is usually as attributed to people like Hilbert uh, four years later. So he, he assumes that the axes are, are harmonic coordinates, boxes is operator, or gamma alpha equal to zero, where gamma alpha is this combination of crystal symbols of this expression. And now Einstein notes that only the on the only term the second derivative is this one. And therefore, the result is of the desired form. Uh, Ricci, in harmonic coordinates, is this expression he wants, plus uh, this H, which is a rational expression of the metric and the first derivatives is the denominator G, or the, the, the determinant of the metric. And these terms all vanish in the linear approximation. By the way, the, in general coordinates, you get then this expression. This is, of course, uh, important for, for, instance, for the discussion of the Cauchy problem. Uh, so you have these additional terms uh, in, uh, expressed uh, in, by gamma alpha. And now he, be, he looks for this field equation. He really has rich equal kappa t mu already here. And, and immediately looks at the linearized approximation. Because uh, it looks good, you see, in these harmonic coordinates. Now, so H is as, uh, as always. I use, by the way, modern notation. He has a cumbersome notation. For instance, the inverse of the metric is gamma with lower indices. He has no upper or lower indices in these early early work, so one has to get used a bit to see his notation. Anyhow, so I use modern notation. And so uh, the har linearized harmonic coordinate condition is this here. And the edge is, of course, the trace, and the indices are rise, raised and lowered with the Minkowski metric. This is what we nowadays call the, in, in our textbooks the Hilbert condition, but actually had it in 1912. Uh, Einstein takes now for T mu nu his earlier expression for dust. But now he runs into a very serious problem. You will, you, I will show you immediately that the trace of the energy momentum tensor must be a constant. <coughs> How does this follow? Uh, from, the, from the weak field conservation or on the linearized level, you have to use this. It follows uh, through the field equation that this here is zero. Hence, uh, as a, a result of the harmonic uh, condition, 
the, the, the gradient of H uh, satisfies the wave equation. And therefore, the trace of the field, uh, therefore, uh, box H has to be a constant. And if, if you know, use the trace of the field equation, T has to be a constant. And for thus, this requires, of course, uh, that the, the energy, uh, the mass density has to be a constant. So one could, that is unacceptable. One could not even describe a star. With, <coughs> so, uh, yeah. Perhaps uh, it's instructive uh, for you if I present the nonlinear version of this problem, because that would be in 1915, uh, showed them up, also in a somewhat different language. Uh, if you do use the covariant divergence less of the TV universe and use the Bianchi identity, which, I, by the way, Einstein did not know in 1915, also Hilbert didn't know it. That's, that's uh, remarkable. But if you use that also, then R has to be constant, and hence the trace of T has to be, again, a constant. So, uh, as I already indicated, Einstein discovered this without knowing the Bianchi the, the, in fall 1915, uh, when he reconsidered the, 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 the previous candidate field equation. And so for a, for a while, uh, he had still the wrong field equation. The trace term was not yet subtracted. That year. But then he ran into this problem. An important remark, from his studies of the static field, in Prague, Einstein was convinced that in the weak field, static limit, the metric must be of the form diagonal g not, not only that was his velocity of light squared, and for us it's the lapse, and spatially flat. But then, of course, box H equal constant would imply that the Laplacian of g not, not is constant, and that, uh, if this is, uh, holds on R3, there's a mathematical fact, and g not, not would have to be a constant. <laughs> Again, I could present a nonlinear version of that, but let me fix that. Now, something really interesting happens. Since, because Einstein had this problem, he, he modified the linearized field equation by subtracting this trace term or written like this. Now, this is the correct to, to a uh, linearized field, field equation of general relativity in harmonic coordinates, of course. Now, I really wonder, why did he not uh, uh, try the same subtraction in, in his nonlinear field equation, either for the rigid tensor or for the metric? It's so natural. It would be so natural. Now, before I discuss the probable reasons, why he did not go on like, uh, like this, I uh, continue with his research notes. Now energy momentum conservation for matter plus gravity comes into play. So in the linearized approximation, the conservation, conservation uh, in quotation marks of t, t is given by this equation here. Now, Einstein replaces here in the second term T alpha beta by the left-hand side of the field equation, of the linearized field equation, uh, and then he gets this expression up to a, pro a proportionality uh, constant. And now he makes several uh, partial integrations in order to transform this into a total divergence. And the total divergence is, well, the, the, the T sigma alpha, uh, lambda is written here. You don't have to look at that, but I mean... We know that for spin two. I mean, that, that, that's just correct. And with this substitution, the second term is also a total divergence, and so he gets a conservation law in the ordinary sense. Really, it deserves the name conservation law. Now, come, I come to the... To the problem is a Newtonian limit. I mean, this is really, in a way, incredible, what, the, what now happens. He does not get it, as you will soon see. And this is one of the reasons why Einstein abandoned the general covariance of the field equations. 
Apparently, the modified field equations did not reduce to the correct uh, Newtonian limit. That it leads to the Poisson equation is fine, but because of the harmonic condition, uh, the metric cannot be spatially flat. And Einstein found this unacceptable. He was convinced, I recall, that the weak field that has this form. That, by the way, he also already noted on the first page of his note notebook that he thought this is fixed. Now, in the Prague paper, where he makes this assumption, he says, he expresses a warning, he said, this may very well turn out to be wrong. And then uh, he adds, on the rotating disk, it's, it is actually wrong. But here, he forgot about this remark, obviously, and comes to the conclusion, I don't get the, the Newtonian limit. I mean, here you can only uh, quote Goethe, if wise men did not err, fools should despair. So this was one of the reasons. It's not the only one, but it, it, it was a crucial reason. <clears throat> now, others are coming. Partly a bit strange. <clears throat> Einstein wanted to have such a conservation law for the full theory, for the nonlinear theory. And at that time, he was convinced that the, the energy momentum tensor and this energy momentum complex of, of the gravitational field should have the same transformation properties. He says that explicitly, actually, at the annual meeting of the Swiss Physical Society. Uh, and that can, of course, not be, a, a, it's not possible if these are generally covariant tensors. Uh, this is also another reason. Uh, when I t talked about that to some people who know the subject also quite well, they, they were, were really a bit puzzled. But I have at least three uh, uh, documents where this comes, becomes clear. He wrote a letter almost at the same time to Lawrence and then uh, repeated this at the, in his famous Vienna lecture uh, later in the year 1913. <laughs> later he came up with another argument which I think convinced him at the time even more. He came up uh, with an argument that apparently was against determinism. And this is the famous whole argument which I will repeat uh, uh, more or less at the end of the, of the talk. That convinced him mostly and he wrote about it to all his friends, Lawrence, Ehrenfest, and so on. Now I want to show you how, how, he, how he, uh, he got the so-called uh, dwarf equations with, with Grossman. The way he proceeds is actually with, uh, quite similar. Of course, there are no, no harmonic conditions. He, has no, he doesn't know the, the, the group, which is behind all that. But, uh, he, he, of course, he wants to maintain this equation here for, for T. Einstein makes, as I already said, his ansatz, more or less the same as I sh showed before. And now he, he, he proceeds as before in the linearized theory. He replaces T uh, al uh, alpha beta by gamma and wants to uh, get all the total divergence to get the conservation law. And now to find that, uh, the H, it just first looks at this contribution, makes again partial integrations, and finds an H such that he gets a total divergence. And there is, you don't have to look at the result. I mean, it is for us, of course, a very ugly thing. He, he has his first term, of course, and then, and then others. And here, T mu nu, which is given by this. And of course, he has now a, a conservation law and, and the field equation. This is art, the Einstein-Grossmann field equations. Let me remind you how things are in, in general relativity when one does the analogous thing. Uh, so you just replace T alpha beta by the Einstein tensor, and this is really a total divergence with Einstein's pseudo tensor. And then one gets this conservation law, but of course T mu, mu is a, is a, a pseudo tensor. By the way, this conservation law is equivalent to the Bianchi identity. Uh, it's not difficult to see that. And this played a role then in 1950, because Einstein didn't know the Bianchi identity. He, he had to do such things. I sh show you just one page where, uh, from the notebook where he does his manipulations, his partial integrations. Uh, so you get, and so you, you see, 
in, on this page, there is not a single word. I mean, it, it just does computations. But I repeated it with Mr. G Mule upstairs, and I got that the same result. <laughs> Yeah, in the paper of Einstein and Grossman, they claim that their procedure leads to a unique result. This is, of course, not true. Uh, later in the Vienna lecture, he showed uh, that the Newtonian limit in, this sen in his sense comes out okay with a flat spatial metric, as I already emphasized. Uh, so, so that was then satisfactory. With his lifelong friend, Michele Besso, who was an engineer, I mean, he computed the perihelion motion of this Entwurf theory. The manuscript is in the collected papers, and they never published it. It's a very long manuscript. Sometimes Einstein writes, sometimes Besso, and they worked out the perihelion uh, motion and got 5 over 12 of the later Einstein value. So it was, it was not satisfactory. But it's again interesting. I mean, Einstein always wanted to have contact with, with, him, with the facts. Now, a, a few uh, further remarks about the two Einstein-Grossmann papers. First, they generalize also the Maxwell's equation to, to the general covariant form we all know and which is still valid today. So his part has completely survived. Einstein then also discusses the possibility of, the scale, of a scalar theory and comes to the conclusion this is impossible, one would violate energy conservation. He made subtle errors, uh, but let me not talk about that. And then uh, they, also, they wanted to now find out what is the covariance group of, of their dwarf theory. Uh, they hoped, of course, to, to have more than linear transformations, also transformations to uniform accelerated frames. And for that, and that's the main reason why I show it, they formulate everything in terms of a, of a, Hamilton, of a, of a variational principle, uh, as we all do. And the Lagrangian then is, is this expression. So in this form, the field equation is, of course, much simpler. And then, really, they find out that the covariance group in, contains also certain um, Nonlinear transformations. <coughs> yeah, here another remark. Einstein's later papers often start with such variational principles. Hilbert was not the first one who used them, but uh, Hilbert was, uh, I, I think, really the first one who used the, the Ricci scalar. But one should once, I say one thing. Shortly afterwards, Einstein had this paper also on a variational formulation. And he also included the right boundary con uh, term, which now is now attributed to, to uh, Hawking, Gibbons, York, and so on. That is in the 1916 paper of Einstein. I mean, I find this also a bit ridiculous. You know, the boundary terms you get when you, when, uh, yeah, that is, that is uh, there. Uh, how I, am I doing? Yeah, that, that is good, I think. <clears throat> I should perhaps say something about the Einstein Fokker theory um, for certain reasons. Fokker was a student of Lorentz and visited Einstein uh, at ETH in 1913, and they worked out an, a scalar theory of gravity, a nonlinear theory of gravity, uh, which is connected, of course, with Nordstrom theory, but it's a fully co uh, consistent nonlinear theory. In flat space time formulation, uh, you have this kinetic part and then the, the matter part where the, uh, the, the Minkowski metric is rescaled uh, times this fact factor here. So if you replace this metric by a physical metric, uh, then, uh, then the, the Minkowski metric disappears. And with respect to this physical metric, that for instance, the Compton wavelength is then really a constant independent of the space-time point. Afterwards, or, or say, say, of course, then translate this theory into a geometric one, uh, which has, is uh, described by the following four properties, or three properties. Space-time is conformally flat. 
the wild tensor vanishes, uh, the field equation is given by this here, test particle follow geodesics, and the, you can, of course, now write everything in adaptive coordinates, and you get this nonlinear equation. Now, in, I want to make a remark connected with general covariance as, op, as opposed to general invariance. These two concepts are usually not identical, and this caused a lot of confusion. I mean, the, the generation of Einstein and also later Fock and, and so on were not clear about all that. And, and the, the controversies were sometimes really strange. Read the preface of Fock on, on, in his book on relativity. What I want to emphasize is this object, G twiddle, this is G mu nu, over the, the fourth root of the determinant is an absolute tensor density. And by this I mean that it is diffeomorphic as a tensor to, uh, density to, to eta mu nu, one minus one and so on. Therefore, this is not a dynamical object, and the invariance group is therefore the conformal group, which is a finite dimensional Lie group. I mean, the, the invariance group, particle physicists are used to that, is, is, is that group which leaves the absolute elements fixed. Uh, and here, uh, this is an absolute uh, object. Another point, since in the scalars of Nordstrom and this generalization of einstein fock there is no global light deflection, although the equivalence principle is satisfied. Students are sometimes for good reasons, a bit confused by that. Einstein urged in 1913 astronomers to measure the light deflection during the solar eclipse in the coming year in the Crimea. Moreover, it, the theory predicts minus one six, the Einstein value, for the period in advance, in contrast to observation. By the way, that's a very nice student exercise very early in a course because uh, one does not have, one can use the, the adapted field equation. <clears throat> Now, I, 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 I gave you the whole argument using a, a bit more modern language, but it's equivalent. This was first stated, I think, at the annual meeting of the Swiss Naturforschung der Gesellschaft in September 1930. Einstein states, it is possible to demonstrate by a general argument that the equations that completely determine the gravitational field cannot be generally covariant with respect to arbitrary substitutions. And he repeated that argument afterwards in his Vienna lecture again. And the, the, the argument was based on the following. Imagine some, uh, some matter distribution and, and a metric which satisfies a covariant field equation. Now go to a place where there is no matter, uh, make a hole, uh, pick out the region, the so-called hole. Now make a diffeomorphism uh, and apply it to the metric, which is only non-trivial within this whole and outside the identity. So the push forward of, of this metric is, is, of course, then again a solution of the field equation, but a different one because of the diffeomorphism, invariance of the field equation, or <coughs> of covariance. <coughs> now Einstein was very puzzled by that. He thought this is violating determinism. He saw, says causality. So again, uh, you know, in other words, generally covariant field equations have a huge family of solutions for one and the same matter distribution. And he thought, given uh, initial or boundary conditions, this should be uh, unique. Uh, the, the solution space should then be, be unique. But uh, according to this whole argument, this is, of course, not true. Now, it took really a long time until Einstein understood that what, uh, that behind this is what we now call gauge invariance or diffeomorphism invariance, that two different solutions describe the same physics. Uh, this is, of course, a crucial point. But it took him about three years to understand that fully. After he understood it, he wrote to Besso, uh, everything in the old argument was correct up to the final conclusion. I think I come now to the final remarks. Uh, I can't stop at any point, but w what I find really very nice. Uh, when, when Einstein had, was on the 
big stress in 1915 in November, uh, finishing his, his uh, theory. He stopped all correspondence with all the, all the colleagues, but he still uh, uh, corresponded with Michele Besso. And wrote in on this, uh, on this date, by the way, before subtracting the trace term, uh, for that reason something is a bit strange here, I have worked with great success during these months. General covariant gravitational equations, motions of the perihelion, quant perihelion quantitatively explained, role of gravity in the structure of matter, um, that has to do with this thing. You will be amazed. I worked horribly strenuously, shouterhaft angestellt in German. It is strange that one can endure that. Now, Besto immediately passed his postcard to, uh, to Zanker, uh, no, uh, the other very important friend uh, in Zurich. I enclosed the historical card of Einstein reporting the setting of the capstone of an epoch that began with Newton's apple. And perhaps as a final quotation, I was present in... I was present in... No, no I, I don't show that. I was present when Pauli uh, gave a talk namely when there was a ceremonial presentation of Hubacher's bust in Zurich. Pauli then said, and I think this is fully correct, the general theory of relativity is then completed and in contrast to special relativity, a uh, special theory worked out by Einstein alone without simultaneous contributions by other researchers will forever remain the classic example of a theory of per perfect beauty in its mathematical structure. Some people's Nowadays, say, well, he has stolen everything from Hilbert, and so I think this is absolutely ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe there are many questions, or I, I don't know, but uh, if you have some short comments or questions, yeah. Okay, now. Uh, about, you see, the booklet is very funny. He starts from one side with gravity and from the other with quantum theory. And says, at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about 100. Uh, yeah. He does a lot of crossing out. I mean, he tries things all the time, then he gives up. And, uh, Yeah. Oh, also that, and what he then in the 1917 cosmology paper called the Mach principle that matter should determine the metric uniquely. This is also funny. I mean, it's really strange. I mean, matter depends on the metric also. I mean, this is just a coupling. And uh, yeah, um, probably he was uh, going forth and back. Of course, later he had to make coordinate choices uh, when he studied, for instance, post Newtonian celestial mechanics and things like that. Uh, I mean, he never accepted the uh, Ah, that is true. That, that is another thing, yes. Yeah, yeah. And his argument against black holes, I of course, uh, has no value, I mean. No, he was not always right. <laughs> By the way, I have published uh, uh, what I told you on the bit more uh, very recently. I think it was two weeks ago, if you want to see the, uh, no. in Annal and the Physique. That was Einstein's most favorite journal for a long time. So this is appeared, I think, two weeks ago. And you can, uh, here is the DOI number if you want to read it. <clears throat> so if there are no other questions. Uh, oh, yes, one more. Is it possible for us to look at the notebooks in the web? Or the you see, um, the gravity part is in the collected works, Faxim partly facsimile, but then it's also written out. And also, the, all the crossings are reproduced. I mean, so you can, you, you can. Uh, you should have that in, perhaps in the library. Of course, things are in German, but I told you there are almost no, there is almost no text. I mean, uh, so with, with a little dictionary, you can easily find out what he writes. I mean. Well, okay, let's thank the speaker again.